Thanks, Sue. That's terrific. Hey, um, okay, well, I want to get started talking a little bit about you, and then I want to talk about how to play Boogie Woogie, because I know a lot of the people here viewing today are Boogie Woogie piano players. And so we want to know how you got those sounds. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. You have a, wow, what a career. So what are some of the high points of your career? I know you were inducted into the San Diego Hall of Fame. Yeah, right. Which, you know how awards go and stuff, they they don't always mean a lot, but that it meant a lot to me because they did it in Ocean Beach where I grew up here in San Diego. You remember Ocean Beach? Sure. <laughs> yeah, and um, it, it was just, you know, touching. I was in the first group too that they, when they originated the, the Music Hall of Fame, so. And you also have, there's a Sue Palmer Day, a day now named after you by the city. March 25th, that was 2008. That was, yeah. I, I am fortunate to have uh, good friends that are involved in politics and, you know, they're really sweet and they have awarded people that they knew and I, I was very proud of that. Well, we're proud of you, that's fantastic. And then Le Monde, in Paris uh, wrote that she possesses all the secrets of Boogie Woogie. I know, Lamont, I mean, I can't believe that, you know, it was fantastic. That was when I was playing for Candy Kane okay. and Candy Kane, who you remember, I'm sure, yeah. it was an artist that came out of San Diego and uh, I ended up playing with her and she took us around the world, you know, and it really did give me, uh, visibility it made it look like I had a career too. I mean, you know, it was really fun. I know what you mean. How many CDs have you recorded of your of your own? Oh gosh, I don't know, at least ten or so. You know, like ten, and they cover some other genres too. I know there's one on solo piano. Yeah, and that was nominated for a, a blues. Uh, it that won. won. It won that year. The best blues album by the San Diego Music Awards. Congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> that is just great. So um, let's see. And then Choose John in 2015, an Amazon reviewer wrote that nominated your album Bricktop as album of the year. Yeah, they, he loved that album. And it actually is one of my favorite ones that I did too. Now, can, can our viewers go uh, hear some snippets of these songs and stuff by going to your website? Yeah, they're my, I have a wonderful website. It's, it's suepalmer.com. And uh, it um, has snippets on every album and has the list of albums and a lot of tons of stuff. Okay. More than you could possibly read, probably. <laughs> I just want to say that three of Sue's albums are on eBay. Th three of Sue's autographed albums are on eBay. They're selling for $149 a piece. You're kidding. I didn't know that. Yeah. So when we say Queen of Boogie Woogie, we mean it. <laughs> now, let's see. Maybe we could, oh, and what about, tell us about Hatta Brooks. I don't know if a lot of people know who she was. She was a big star, uh, especially in the late forties and they called her queen of the boogie. And I got to meet her and do a show with her um, through these two uh, very uh, quirky older ladies that had you know, been friends with her for years. She lived up in uh, Boyle Heights uh, out of LA and she was just gorgeous and beautiful in every way. And I met her when she was 85 and she came down here. She, she couldn't play Boogie Woogie anymore because her hands were, you know, arthritic, but uh, she still could put on a show and her timing or comedic timing was just excellent. And we had a show down here with Myself, another queen that lives up in Northern California, Wendy DeWitt, and um, a fellow, uh, Philippe Lejeune from France, and Hatta. And she was the big headliner, and it was this giant sold out show. And so I started it off because I was uh, the hostess. And um, in the middle of my set, she got up and sat down on my piano bench and started playing with me. <laughs> 
And I have a video of it. That's on my website because it's like all the boogie woogie players knew who she was, know who she is pretty much. And uh, she was fantastic when she was younger. I mean, she used to open, you know, uh, for big bands like Count Basie and up in LA on, um, what was the name of that street in LA that's so famous? Anyway, all the big giant black bands played on it. And uh, she was a big star, you know, with her name and lights and everything. And anyway, she was just a delight. And that show uh, was her next to the last show that she performed and she died a couple months later. So I was really lucky. She must have been real happy to do that show with y'all. She loved it. That's she great. That's great that you could do that, Sue. Let's see, I have some other notes here. Let's, who were your main influences? For well, mainly I, um, uh, my family were very musical. And that's what we did when the family all got together. One of my aunts was a professional sax jazz player. And uh, my aunt that I lived with for many years, she lived with my family, um, was a really good piano player. And what's so the, they, they would, um, the closest she got to Boogie Woogie was St. Louis Blues. Okay. Yeah, but it wasn't like we do, you know, it wasn't big left hand thing or anything but um it was very bluesy and um anyway they taught me you know i just play a lot I'd play ukulele or something because they were all so good and i you know was just a little kid and so then when i was um i i mentioned i grew up in ocean beach and my parents sent me to this my piano teacher and the baptist church was down the street and i sometimes go with my little neighbor friend to to um, vacation Bible school because we didn't have anything else to do, you know. So I go to that and I heard someone playing Do Lord Do Remember Me Boogie Woogie style at the church. And I don't even remember what if it was a man or a woman or whatever, but I went back and told my teacher I wanted to learn how to play like that. So he gave me the original Boogie Woogie sheet music from Pine Top Smith that was I think it was published in like 1916 or something like that. And I just practiced it and practiced it and practiced it. And I learned some other boogie woogie, you know, left hand patterns and stuff. And so that was really my main influence. And then um, as I got older, I, you know, listened to Ray Charles a lot, a lot and um, other people, Janis Joplin had a piano player Remember that song, Turtle Blues? Some people, it wasn't one of her big hits or anything, but it was on one of her albums and I could hear the piano. Uh -huh. And that, anyway, I just would just play it over and over and over again at home, you know? Yeah. <laughs> how did it, you learn the left hands? How, how did, did somebody have to teach you those or how did you figure them out? I don't know. There was one particular, well, the, that the Pine Top Smith piece had it written down. Was it, that's the walking one, isn't it? Yeah, and um, do you want me to demonstrate it? Or yes, I, but put your laptop camera down. Okay. Like Is that, that yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So Pine Top, it, first it starts like. So it's this one, and then it goes, it shifts eventually to. So I learned that one. And then another one that I did for um, ever, and it got imprinted on my brain <laughs> so I can do it without thinking about it, because that's what you have to do. Right. Otherwise, you can't solo, you know? So anyway, here's the one I did for many years. That's that. a great one. Now, yeah. what if uh, what if there's people watching who want to play like that, and what's the secret to getting that down? Uh, just doing it over and over and over. That's a, a lot of adults have trouble because they can't get their left hand up to par, and you just have to do it so much. And I was like 12 years old or something, you know, and didn't have anything. I had, 
to do. I mean, I didn't have to work, you know, so I could mindlessly do it until I could forget about it and concentrate on my right hand. You know, for me, this one, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not on him. For me, that was the hardest one. Really? It used to give me cramps in my forearms. I couldn't get through 12 bars. Wow. I can't well, believe that because you're so fabulous. You. Which was the hardest one for you? Um, well, for I can't remember how to do it now because I gave up. <laughs> but that one that they do, Beat Me Daddy Ate to the Bar, that, uh, what's his name? Uh, anyway, I, I tried to learn, I practiced, and I could do it, but I couldn't really solo with my right hand. And it was making my brain crazy. So we all have, you know, different ones that are difficult. Okay, Sue, so here's the $64,000 question. People are always asking me, What's the key to getting the right hand to work with the left and getting them to work together? What is the secret? Well, for me, it was like practicing it so much, the left hand, that it becomes brainless. And, you, and so that you're not even thinking about it. The left hand. The left hand. And then... I mean, you can practice your right hand too, but to do them together, you can't be thinking about your left hand at all. That's my, the way I learned. Now, you know, people have different ways of learning, but if you try to do everything, you know, in the right time, slowly and stuff like that, I mean, that probably works for some people, but it didn't work for me that way, so... How did you learn to improvise licks? Where did you learn licks, for example? Uh, well, I had a couple really cool people teach me a few things and then it was like a door opening thing. Probably I learned a lot from you actually, because you used to write things out <laughs> and you were training all of us to you know, replace you at all the gigs after you left town. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I had a couple, it, it, it's kind of interesting. You never know what's going to work. And I had um, one guy, he showed me this thing. That, something like that. Yeah. What key were you in just now? That, B, B that was B flat. Yeah. Okay, so that is the mother of all licks. So yeah. You were just in heaven when you learned that lick, right? Yeah, because I could learn it and do it a little bit differently here and there, and make, you know, just over and over and over again. And and Ray Charles does that a lot too, you know. So I, I would hear that, and then I and then I had some jazz. I tried to learn how to play more complicated jazz stuff, and nothing worked because they all wanted me to read music and everything, and I wasn't very good at that. And and also they were teaching it for people with big giant hands, which I don't have. So I, ca I can't reach tenths or anything, you know? So, but this one guy said, oh, don't look at the, you know, he just told me to look at the keys, which was perfect for me. And he taught me that kind of thing. And that was a door opening thing. And it, that helped me learn because when you have these different voicings and it goes for boogie woogie or anything, um, it gives you, other notes to play in your solo so that you know i've tried to teach that to people but i'm not very good at teaching so i don't know when you would hear somebody on a record play something and you thought man i just want to do that but i can't figure yeah. out what he's doing or she's doing what how what would you how would you go from there well sometimes i ask people in my band, I mean, I still do this all the time. I said, what, what note is that? Because I tend to hear, a lot of times I just tend to hear chords and I don't get real specific about, and uh, so I just ask for help, you know? Yeah. From yeah. teachers. Some people are really good at one note, you know? And it's, sometimes it's hard with piano because we play so much at the same time. So it's hard to differentiate compared to 
a horn player or something. Sometimes we get locked into our own certain licks too. I find that I get, you know, I'm not adding any new ideas or, so I try to come up with new ideas, but I mean, you've yeah. got 12 notes, how many ideas can you come up with? But still, yeah. uh, we stick to the, a lot of the same licks. I, I like this blue scale thing. I've always gone yeah. G flat F, E flat C. <laughs> I've always done that repetitive. Repetitive. Repeating, repeating things is really good. Which? It, repeating the same thing, you know, for inf sometimes I do the whole thing through a whole 12 bar and yeah, stuff like that. Can you an example? Oh, okay, let's see. Right. Hey, put, the, put the camera down. We can see your hands. <laughs> I mean, Put the camera you, down so we can see your hands. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I can do it. Another thing. Let's see. Okay. That's fantastic. Wow. So how did you come up with the names uh, Motel Swing Band or uh, Orchestra Band? And her Motel Swing Orchestra. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, my drummer, Sharon Shufel, who's played with me, you know, remember Sharon? I, I, know her. I, I yeah. remember her. Yeah, she, she's still my drummer. And she, I kind of like, uh, she came up with the name, but it, it kind of alludes to, um, I kind of play bluesy swing or swingy blues. I mean, you know, that, so it's kind of, uh, and I, at the time when that was, I left Candy's band in 1999 and started my own back here in San Diego. And uh, I had been spending practically almost 10 years on the road, you know, and just with her like 250 dates a year. And so I was like, I felt like an expert on living in a hotel, you know, and, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I just use kind of use those kind of themes that were in my life at the time. I think it's a hip name. You now it might be because I, I too spent a lot of time on the road and when your life gets to the point where a Coke machine and an ice machine are the hippest things in town, it's pretty bad. <laughs> I know. I kind of like the simplicity of it, though. I mean, like, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. So, you know, I, I I like it. I liked it. I enjoyed it, but I got over it, and I'm don't want to. I just do fly-ins now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still, it's really a hip-sounding name. You bring the hipness out of motel living, boy. Let me tell you. <laughs> People that have done this, old world warriors like ourselves, boy, they really know. Yeah. They, you know, I would put a band together and then some guys refused to go. They had reached the point, the saturation point. They yeah. Had, Over it. Other guys were already packing. Oh boy, let's go. Let's get out on yeah. the road. I know. There's nothing like playing in front of a live audience. What advice would you give to boogie woogie players that are maybe beginners or amateurs and they don't have that much self-confidence and they get nervous playing in front of people. What would you say to, to them? Practice makes perfect. I mean, just make yourself do it. Don't, don't play too many things. Do what you're, you know, don't stretch yourself so that you can't do something you can play well. You have to practice. You have to really practice and make sure you're confident enough I, I know people get nervous and stuff I, I grew up um, you know I was expected to play as a little girl you know it was just expected Sue get up and play piano for the company you know and I didn't know you could say no <laughs> so but you know I was the first kid and you know you kind of go along with the program <laughs> so so that kind of helped me because I enjoy, I love playing for people. Is it better to learn one piece 
and get it down solid? Or is it better to experiment with this one and that one? And, and, and you know what I mean? Is it better to just concentrate your focus and your energy on one tune? Um, well, I would say until you, it's good to get your left and right hand all copacetic and flowing. You don't want it to sound jerky, you know, because yeah. that, it loses everything that the rhythm's not really natural. So you definitely have to get one down and then you see how it should be to get the next one. But do you think it's a good idea to read a tune and learn it by the notes? It was for me. I I I I did that original boogie woogie because I didn't know how to improvise or anything. And I was able to read it at I was about 10 or something. And then I also learned, you probably know these uh, honky tonk train that was that's written out. And so if I could hear it and read it, it I, I'm more accurate, you know, yeah. that way. And then also another one written out is down the road a piece. That has it has an interesting I'll play it for the bass end. Um, that's the bass line yeah i like that a lot i know it's a groovy dancers like it too that's on one of your albums isn't it yeah cool I forget one now. <laughs> yeah. but you know yeah. i think we're just about running out of time doggone it this has been fun I think we've covered a lot of ground. Now, if people want to visit your stuff, that's www.suepalmer.com. Right. S-U-E-P-A-L-M-E-R. Yes. Suepalmer.com. And there they'll see all the stuff about your motel swing orchestra and your... My schedule, we're back to work now, which is just fantastic. What is it? We're back to work now. I have a schedule... It tells where I'm playing, um, you know, Good. lots of new exciting things. I mean, things are starting to pop, Good. which is in California anyway. I don't know about other places. How about back there? You're back in New York, right? No, I'm back in North Carolina. North Carolina. Oh, that's right. And, East uh, Coast. Yeah. I know you're East Coast. <laughs> well, I'm on the East Coast, but... We're way out in the country. Our, we're so far out in the country. I went to the unfinished furniture store and the guy sold me a tree. <laughs> that sounds like country living. You know, but I, I did a couple of Facebook concerts out of the house here. So you, did you do that? Did you do any Facebook? Not much. I did one um, on Facebook that a friend of mine said, you have to do that. And because I'm not really that technical and I'm not, I don't enjoy it that much. We did have a, a live audience though, because the neighbors, my neighbors would come because we, no one had anything to do with, you know, else. There was no, nothing last summer. We did front porch concerts and stuff, but I didn't do too, I did a few little things, but not much. There's a lot of video of me on uh, YouTube and everything. On and various. YouTube. Okay, on YouTube, everybody, check it out. Yeah. Well, it's mostly not stuff I've posted. <laughs> so it's all kinds of. But other, uh, your fans and followers posted it. There's a lot from with Candy Cane, too. Uh -huh. When I, did you, did you ever see me when I wore a beehive? I saw you twice with Candy Cane, once in Las Vegas, or maybe oh, yeah. twice in Vegas. Yeah. In San Diego. Yeah, well, I wore that beehive for like years and years for on every gig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. I remember the beehive. I want to tell all, all our friends here, hey, you, you guys have to see Sue with this beehive it's with this tall and the, those white glasses, those right white rimmed glasses. Yeah. It's great. One of these days I'm going to get a beehive and those same glasses. I'm going to go out. You won't. It'll be my soup. No, thank, no, thank you're me. <laughs> Red lipstick and earrings. <laughs> hey, Sue, this has just been so much fun. Thank you so much. Oh, Lynn, it's so good to see you after many years. Thank you. I've wanted to do this for a long time. And 
Today was my lucky day. And all the people who got to take us out with another piece, okay? And then that'll, that'll be our farewell, I guess. Okay. Take us out with some more Boogie Woogie playing. Yeah, here's a tune I wrote uh, called Room Service Boogie. It goes with my motel swing motif. <laughs> this down yeah Maybe. thanks put it down good <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.